Okay, per the Patreon votes, we're continuing our look at Soviet interwar commercial aircraft, although this will be the last one on this topic for the time being. The Tupolev AMT-35, also known by its civil designation of PS-35, was a twin-engine monoplane developed in the mid-1930s by the Tupolev Design Bureau for use as a high-speed passenger transport. With its sleek lines and low-wing monoplane configuration, it marked a visual and aerodynamic departure from earlier Soviet airliners. Compared to the angular ANT-9 or the hulking propaganda machine that was the ANT-20, the ANT-35 looked remarkably graceful. It was a respectable effort, particularly in the context of 1930s aviation, an era in which some countries were still bolting wings onto sheds and calling them commercial aircraft. The ANT-35 represented a commendable attempt to bring the Soviet civil aviation sector somewhat closer to Western ideals of speed, comfort, and operational efficiency, concepts that were often viewed in the USSR as suspiciously bourgeois, but in this case they were tolerated in the name of progress. But, while the aircraft was good and demonstrated sound performance for its time, it was ultimately produced in limited numbers and quickly eclipsed by more capable designs. Today, it occupies a very small and intriguing niche in Soviet aviation history, being technically successful while at the same time utterly redundant, which is why you've probably never heard of it. But it was an important stepping stone on the path to more modern airliners for the Soviet Union, and it gives me an excellent excuse for a shorter video that isn't an hour long for a change. See? I can do quick, informative videos if I want. Sometimes. Maybe. Anyway, the ANT-35's development was closely linked to the success of the earlier ANT-40, better known as the Tupolev SB, which served as the structural and aerodynamic foundation for the new civil design. As a quick aside, this is also one of the rare cases where Tupolev's designs were numbered out of order, as in the ANT-40 was built and flown before the ANT-35. The project was initiated in response to the need for a faster and more comfortable passenger transport for Aeroflot, the Soviet national airline, one that was capable of operating on longer routes than earlier types like the ANT-9. The decision to base the ANT-35 on a proven airframe reflected a practical approach, one aimed at saving time and resources during a period when the Soviet Union's aircraft industry was juggling both military and civilian development, with military receiving the lion's share of the funding. Yet, despite this preference, the ANT-35 was extensively reworked to fulfil its commercial mission, with a redesigned fuselage, a new passenger cabin, and improved streamlining. The ANT-35 was developed at the Tupolev Design Bureau under the supervision of A. Arkhangelsky, with the project officially beginning in 1935. The first prototype, which retained the ANT-35 designation, made its maiden flight in August of 1936, piloted by Mikhail Gromov. While the prototype did share key components with the SB bomber, the most notable difference lay in its fuselage, which had been completely redesigned to carry passengers rather than bombs. The fuselage was slightly widened and deepened to accommodate a six-seat passenger cabin, along with a small baggage compartment and amenities for mail and cargo. Another key distinction was its metal skin. Earlier Tupolev designs, particularly commercial aircraft like the ANT-9 and the massive ANT-20 Maxim Gorky, used corrugated metal skin, a feature inherited from the German Junkers aircraft. Corrugation added rigidity to thin sheet metal, allowing it to span longer distances between structural ribs without buckling. It was a practical solution during the early years of all-metal aircraft, especially when material science and riveted construction methods were still maturing. However, this approach did come at a cost, and that was aerodynamic drag. The ANT-35, by contrast, featured smooth, stressed skin as part of its semi-monocoque construction. This made the aircraft more aerodynamic, enabling higher cruising speeds, it was lighter for the same strength, improving fuel efficiency, and it was much easier to insulate and seal, which was a welcome upgrade for passengers who preferred to not experience the Siberian climate mid-flight. The prototype impressed with its performance. 
It was powered by a pair of Gnomechon 14K Mistral Majors, which were 14-cylinder twin-row air-cooled radials that produced 800 horsepower apiece. This gave the prototype a top speed of 350 km per hour, significantly faster than previous Soviet airliners. This was then further demonstrated on September the 15th, when Gromov flew the prototype from Moscow to Leningrad and back in 3 hours and 38 minutes, with an average speed of 350 km per hour, and at the time this was a new domestic speed and distance record. Not only was the ANT-35 faster, but it had better range and was more comfortable. These traits, and more, were advertised when it made its appearance at the 1936 Paris Air Show. It was one of only two commercial designs on display that could safely fly with one engine shut down, and it had the highest cruising speed. Numerous magazines sang its praises, including Flight Magazine, which said that the ANT-35 showed that over the last two years, Russia had made real technical progress. Which was a nice way of the British saying, oh bugger me, they finally caught up, we should probably design something better now. However, for all of its technical merits, the six-seat cabin proved to be a significant limitation, as was the fact that the wing spar passed through it, which limited the headroom for two of the seat areas to 1.5 meters from floor to ceiling, meaning that unless you were very short, you were having to crouch quite a bit to get in and out of your seat, not particularly comfortable. While it may have satisfied the bureaucratic target of passenger accommodation, Aeroflot quickly realised that the economics of operating an aircraft designed to carry fewer people than a standard tram car was less than ideal, particularly for longer haul routes. Thus, development quickly shifted to a larger and more commercially viable variant. In response, the design team at Tupolev produced an improved second prototype, designated the ANT-35 Biz, with a longer fuselage allowing up to 10 passengers, increased baggage capacity, and improved access for both boarding and maintenance. This version would form the basis for all production aircraft and was redesignated as PS-35, the PS standing for passenger transport. The passenger cabin was arranged in two rows of five seats. Each seat had a window, and the cabin included lighting and heating, which was an upgrade over many contemporary Soviet designs of the time, which often emphasised ruggedness over comfort. In terms of performance, the PS35 received a boost, as it was re-engined with the M62IR, a license-built version of the Wright Cyclone engine, and rated at 1000 horsepower. Driving Hamilton's standard propellers, these gave the PS35 a top speed of 372 km per hour and a cruising speed of 346, which was a big jump over the prototype despite a 500 kg weight increase. The PS35 initially entered operational service with Aeroflot in 1937, flying medium range routes such as the Moscow to Stockholm route, Moscow to Prague, and Moscow to Berlin. These international legs were as much about optics as they were about connectivity. Each flight was a reminder to foreign observers that Soviet aviation could, in fact, produce a sleek and modern airliner. In service, the PS-35s were admired for their high cruising speeds, which made them one of the fastest civil aircraft in European service by the late 1930s. For passengers more accustomed to the boxy, slow and drafty earlier designs that were flying with Aeroflot, such as the ANT-9, the PS-35 offered a notable, if not luxurious, improvement. The addition of climate control and noise insulation was especially appreciated by those who did prefer to travel without the risk of A going deaf or B catching pneumonia, Though, to be fair, the soundproofing was more of a suggestion than something that truly worked. Supposedly, you still had to have a conversation at little less than a shout if you wanted your neighbour to actually understand you. But, despite being a huge improvement, overall, on its predecessors, the PS35 was doomed to remain a rarity. Only nine examples of this modern aircraft were built between 1937 and 1939, a modest production run by any measure, especially one for a nation that became somewhat notorious for building things in bulk. Now, the reasons for this limited output were many and, to be honest, familiar. 
Firstly, the aircraft entered service just as larger and more efficient transports, like the Douglas DC-3 and its Soviet-licensed-built version, the Li-2, were beginning to dominate international and domestic routes. Against these new benchmarks, the PS-35 began to look like a boutique solution in a world increasingly favouring these larger commercial machines. Secondly, the Tupolev Design Bureau was shifting its focus almost entirely toward military development, churning out aircraft like the Tupolev SB at a rate more in line with national priorities. And this was not a situation unique to Tupolev either. Civil aircraft, in terms of design priority, were more or less pushed aside across the board. Finally, the political atmosphere of the late 1930s, which was thick with suspicion and militarization and gulags and other nasty things, did little to encourage the development of elegant passenger transports. As we saw in the previous video on the ANT-20, Stalin's political purges caused a huge amount of disruption to the aircraft industry, and following Tupolev's arrest in 1937, there was very little incentive to continue improving the PS-35, particularly when it was already being thoroughly outclassed. As such, there were no major subvariants, no foreign export sales, and no dramatic redesigns. The aircraft served exclusively within the Soviet Union, operated solely by Aeroflot. By the early 1940s, the PS-35 had largely disappeared from frontline passenger service. Some were likely reassigned during the Second World War to secondary roles, such as liaison or courier duties, though wartime records are sparse. There's no evidence the PS-35 saw any military use or served anywhere near the front lines, though given the chaos of early wartime logistics following the German invasion of the Soviet Union, it is possible that one or two might have been repurposed for some emergency missions at the time. Regardless of what happened, they faded into the background without much fuss, which for a Soviet airframe was a remarkably peaceful exit at this time. When compared against its international contemporaries, the PS-35 sits somewhere in the middle of the very difficult to quantify scale of was it good or was it bad, it really depends on who you talk to and which armchair historians you choose to listen to, I put myself within that category. It was faster and more advanced than the three main trimotors of the era, the Junkers Ju-52, the Fokker F7, and the Ford Trimotor, designs that continued trundling through European skies long after they could have been replaced, and of which had the aerodynamic grace of a flying breadbox. The PS-35 also compared favourably with other more modern Western designs like the Boeing Model 247. Indeed, those two were a close match in capacity and performance. But the PS-35, like most others of its class, was outclassed, decisively, by the Douglas DC-3, whose 21-passenger capacity, longer range, and superior economy essentially redefined what an airliner could and should be. The Soviet Union's decision to license produce the DC-3 as the Li-2 rendered the PS-35 redundant before it even had time to appear useful. In the end, the PS-35 can be categorised as neither a failure nor a success. Rather, it was one of those many forgotten transitional types that was overcome by the rapid march of progress, bridging the gap between the crude airlines of the 1920s and the more capable transports of the 1940s and beyond. As always, thank you all so much for watching, and a big thank you of course to the Patreon supporters. Yes, I have actually done a shorter video for a change, miracles do in fact happen, I know. Mind you, it is kind of hard to do a long video on a plane with minimal service history and very few reliable sources documenting it, but hey ho, here we are anyway. Besides, it's been a while since I've covered something truly obscure, and after all that is what I sort of have become known for, so I might as well stick to doing that. A big thank you, of course, to our Wing Commander tier patrons, our highest tier supporters, and a warm welcome to Mont Squire, who is the newest member of this special group. Now, I'm going to be away for a short one-week break for some much-needed R&R, so I may not be too active in the comments until my return next weekend. However, I will check in when I can. 
But as always, thank you all so much for your continued support, and I will catch you all next time. Goodbye.